Lesson 9 A City Called Confusion Sabbath Afternoon May 20 The term Babylon is derived from Babel and signifies confusion. It is employed in scripture to designate the various forms of false or apostate religion. In Revelation chapter 17, Babylon is represented as a woman, a figure which is used in the Bible as the symbol of a church, a virtuous woman representing a pure church, a vile woman, an apostate church. The Great Controversy, page 381. The solemn messages that have been given in their order in the Revelation are to occupy the first place in the minds of God's people. Nothing else is to be allowed to engross our attention. Precious time is rapidly passing, and there is danger that many will be robbed of the time which should be given to the proclamation of the messages that God has sent to a fallen world. Satan is pleased to see the diversion of minds that should be engaged in a study of the truths which have to do with eternal realities. The testimony of Christ, a testimony of the most solemn character, is to be born to the world. All through the book of Revelation there are the most precious elevating promises and there are also warnings of the most fearful solemn import. Will not those who profess to have a knowledge of the truth read the testimony given to John by Christ? Here is no guesswork, no scientific deception. Here are the truths that concern our present and future welfare. What is the chaff to the wheat? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8 pages 301 and 302. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our study. The last book of the New Testament scriptures is full of truth that we need to understand. Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad of any excuse for not making the revelation their study. But Christ, through his servant John, has here declared what shall be in the last days, and he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. This is life eternal, Christ said, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. John chapter 17, verse 3. Why is it that we do not realize the value of this knowledge? Why are not these glorious truths glowing in our hearts, trembling upon our lips, and pervading our whole being? Christ's Object Lessons, page 133. We should keep ever before us the fact that time is short. Iniquity is increasing on every hand. The righteous are set as lights in the world. Through them the glory of God is to be revealed to the world. Keep ever before you the solemn events of the future, the great review of the judgment, and the coming of Christ. You with your family are to prepare for that day. This Day with God, page 322. Sunday, May 21. Two Contrasting Systems the Lord is about to punish the world for its iniquity. He is about to punish religious bodies for their rejection of the light and truth which has been given them. The great message, combining the first, second, and third angel's messages, is to be given to the world. This is to be the burden of our work. Those who truly believe in Christ will openly conform to the law of Jehovah. The Sabbath is the sign between God and His people, and we are to make visible our conformity to the law of God by observing the Sabbath. It is to be the mark of distinction between God's chosen people and the world. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 949. The Woman Babylon, of Revelation chapter 17, is described as arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots. Revelation chapter 17, verses 4 to 6. 
the power that for so many centuries maintained despotic sway over the monarchs of Christendom is Rome. The purple and scarlet color, the gold and precious stones and pearls vividly picture the magnificence and more than kingly pomp affected by the haughty sea of Rome. And no other power could be so truly declared drunken with the blood of the saints as that church which has so cruelly persecuted the followers of Christ. Babylon is also charged with the sin of unlawful connection with the kings of the earth. It was by departure from the Lord and alliance with the heathen that the Jewish church became a harlot, and Rome, corrupting herself in like manner by seeking the support of worldly powers, receives a like condemnation. The Great Controversy, page 382. Two great opposing powers are revealed in the last great battle. On one side stands the creator of heaven and earth. All on his side bear his signet. They are obedient to his commands. On the other side stands the prince of darkness, with those who have chosen apostasy and rebellion. The present is a solemn, fearful time for the church. The angels are already girded awaiting the mandate of God to pour their vials of wrath upon the world. Destroying angels are taking up the work of vengeance, for the Spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. Satan is also mustering his forces of evil, going forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them under his banner to be trained for the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Satan is to make most powerful efforts for the mastery in the last great conflict. Fundamental principles will be brought out and decisions made in regard to them. Skepticism is prevailing everywhere. Ungodliness abounds. The faith of individual members of the church will be tested as though there were not another person in the world. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, pages 982 and 983. Monday, May 22. The Wine of the Wrath. Our warfare is aggressive. Tremendous issues are before us, yea, and right upon us. Let our prayers ascend to God that the four angels may still hold the four winds, that they may not blow to injure or destroy until the last warning has been given to the world. Then let us work in harmony with our prayers. Let nothing lessen the force of the truth for this time. The present truth is to be our burden. The third angel's message must do its work of separating from the churches a people who will take their stand on the platform of eternal truth. Our message is a life and death message, and we must let it appear as it is, the great power of God. We are to present it in all its telling force. Then the Lord will make it effectual. It is our privilege to expect large things, even the demonstration of the Spirit of God. This is the power that will convict and convert the soul. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, Page 61 Satan is setting his trained agents at work and moving them to intense activity. He is securing his army of human agents to engage in the last conflict against the Prince of Life to overthrow the law of God, which is the foundation of his throne. Satan will work with miraculous presentations to confirm men in the belief that he is what he claims to be the prince of this world, and that victory is his. He will turn his forces against those who are loyal to God. But though he may cause pain, distress, and human agony, he cannot defile the soul. He may cause affliction to the people of God as he did to Christ, but he cannot cause one of Christ's little ones to perish. The people of God in these last days must expect to enter into the thick of the conflict. For the prophetic word says, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1153.
The season of distress before God's people will call for a faith that will not falter. His children must make it manifest that He is the only object of their worship and that no consideration, not even that of life itself, can induce them to make the least concession to false worship. To the loyal heart, the commands of sinful, finite men will sink into insignificance beside the word of the eternal God. Truth will be obeyed, though the result be imprisonment or exile or death. Satan with all the hosts of evil cannot destroy the weakest of God's saints. Angels that excel in strength will protect them, and in their behalf, Jehovah will reveal himself as a God of gods, able to save to the uttermost those who have put their trust in him. Prophets and Kings, pages 512 and 513. Tuesday, May 23. Mystery, Babylon the Great. No sooner was the earth repeopled than men resumed their hostility to God and heaven. They transmitted their enmity to their posterity as though the art and device of misleading men and causing them to continue the unnatural warfare was a sacred legacy. This confederacy was born of rebellion against God. The dwellers on the plain of Shinar established their kingdom for self-exaltation, not for the glory of God. Had they succeeded, a mighty power would have borne sway, banishing righteousness and inaugurating a new religion. The world would have been demoralized. The mixture of religious ideas with erroneous theories would have resulted in closing the door to peace, happiness, and security. These suppositions, erroneous theories, carried out and perfected, would have directed minds from allegiance to the divine statutes and the law of Jehovah would have been ignored and forgotten. Determined men, inspired and urged on by the first great rebel, would have resisted any interference with their plans or their evil course. In the place of the divine precepts, they would have substituted laws framed in accordance with the desires of their selfish hearts in order that they might carry out their purposes. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, pages 1091 and 1092. Those who are striving to be overcomers will be pursued by the temptations of the enemy. Satan will tempt them to corrupt the principles which all must maintain who would reach the high standard that God has set before them. Satan rejoices when he can lead souls to follow mistaken ideas until their names are blotted out of the book of life and recorded among the names of the unjust. We can overcome only in the way that Christ overcame, by wholehearted obedience to every commandment of God. True religion is obedience to all the commandments of God. Every soul who is saved must surrender his own plans and follow where Christ leads the way. The understanding must be yielded up to Christ for him to cleanse and refine and purify. This will always be done when we receive aright the teachings of Christ. Oh, how much we need a more intimate acquaintance with him! We need to enter into his purpose and to carry out his will, saying with the whole heart, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? This Day with God, page 322. We must put on every piece of the heavenly armor and then stand firm. The Lord has honored us by choosing us as his soldiers. Let us fight bravely for him, maintaining the right in every transaction. Rectitude in all things is essential to the warfare of the soul. Put on as your breastplate that divinely protected righteousness which it is the privilege of all to wear. This will protect your spiritual life. If we have on the heavenly armor, we shall find that the assaults of the enemy will not have power over us. Angels of God will be round about us to protect us. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1119. Wednesday, May 24. A Call to Commitment 
Human power and human might did not establish the church of God, and neither can they destroy it. Not on the rock of human strength, but on Christ Jesus, the rock of ages, was the church founded, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. The presence of God gives stability to his cause. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, is the word that comes to us. Psalm 146, verse 3. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. God's glorious work, founded on the eternal principles of right, will never come to naught. It will go on from strength to strength, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Prophets and Kings, page 595. In the darkest days of her long conflict with evil, the Church of God has been given revelations of the eternal purpose of Jehovah. His people have been permitted to look beyond the trials of the present to the triumphs of the future, when the warfare having been accomplished, the redeemed will enter into possession of the promised land. These visions of future glory, scenes pictured by the hand of God, should be dear to His Church today, when the controversy of the ages is rapidly closing and the promised blessings are soon to be realized in all their fullness. Many were the messages of comfort given the church by the prophets of old. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1, was Isaiah's commission from God. And with the commission were given wonderful visions that have been the believer's hope and joy through all the centuries that have followed. Despised of men, persecuted, forsaken, God's children in every age have nevertheless been sustained by his sure promises. By faith they have looked forward to the time when he will fulfill to his church the assurance, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 15. Prophets and Kings, page 722. Every soul must have a realization that Christ is his personal Savior. Then love and zeal and steadfastness will be manifest in the Christian life. Christ should never be out of the mind. The angel said concerning him, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, precious Savior! Assurance, helpfulness, security, and peace are all in him. He is the dispeller of all our doubts, the earnest of all our hopes. How precious is the thought that we may indeed become partakers of the divine nature whereby we may overcome as Christ overcame. Jesus is the fullness of our expectation. He is the melody of our songs, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. He is living water to the thirsty soul. He is our refuge in the storm. He is our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. When Christ is our personal Savior, we shall show forth the praises of Him who hath called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Reflecting Christ, page 21. Thursday, May 25. Babylon, the center of idolatry. Idolatry and all the sins that followed in its train were abhorrent to God, and he commanded his people not to mingle with other nations to do after their works and forget God. He forbade their marriage with idolaters, lest their hearts should be led away from him. It was just as necessary then as it is now that God's people should be pure, unspotted from the world. They must keep themselves free from its spirit because it is opposed to truth and righteousness. But God did not intend that his people in self-righteous exclusiveness should shut themselves away from the world so that they could have no influence upon it. Like their master, the followers of Christ in every age were to be the light of the world. The Savior said, A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, 
and it giveth light unto all that are in the house, that is, in the world. And he adds, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14-16 to 16. This is just what Enoch and Noah, Abraham, Joseph, and Moses did. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 369 He who searches the heart desires to win his people from every species of idolatry. Let the Word of God, the blessed book of life, occupy the tables now filled with useless ornaments. Spend your money in buying books that will be the means of enlightening the mind in regard to present truth. Grasp the word of the Lord as the treasure of infinite wisdom and love. This is the guidebook that points out the path to heaven. It points us to the sin-pardoning Savior, saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. Oh, that you would search the scriptures with prayerful hearts and a spirit of surrender to God. Oh, that you would search your hearts as with a lighted candle and discover and break the finest thread that binds you to worldly habits which divert the mind from God. Plead with God to show you every practice that draws your thoughts and affections from Him. God has given His holy law to man as His measure of character. By this law you may see and overcome every defect in your character. You may sever yourself from every idol and link yourself to the throne of God by the golden chain of grace and truth. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 318 The men of Noah's generation were not all, in the fullest acceptation of the term, idolaters. Many professed to be worshippers of God. They claimed that their idols were representations of the deity and that through them the people could obtain a clearer conception of the divine being. This class were foremost in rejecting the preaching of Noah. As they endeavored to represent God by material objects, their minds were blinded to his majesty and power. They ceased to realize the holiness of his character or the sacred, unchanging nature of his requirements. Man will rise no higher than his conceptions of truth, purity, and holiness. If the mind is never exalted above the level of humanity, if it is not uplifted by faith to contemplate infinite wisdom and love, the man will be constantly sinking lower and lower. The worshippers of false gods clothed their deities with human attributes and passions, and thus their standard of character was degraded to the likeness of sinful humanity. Conflict and Courage, page 50. For further reading, The Upward Look, Laborers Needed for the Harvest, page 58, and Selected Messages, Every human being will be either in Christ's army or Satan's army. Book 3, page 423.